something you may have said. Uh, but before we get into that, uh, what I'd like to do today is kind of dispel, uh, dispel the myth of lean or Six Sigma, one being better than the other, or one being used instead of the other. Um, think about picking the right method for the right time, which may help you better understand uh, the usefulness of both methodologies, and then hopefully move beyond the debate and focus on your own business results. Now, I mentioned um, I could be at the culprit here, but so I'm going to do a mea culpa for those of you who do not know what mea culpa means. Uh, it's an acknowledgement of one's fault or error. And although I don't feel I'm at fault, I may have made an error when I made reference to uh, someone asked me the question, which came first, Lean or Six Sigma? And I wrote an article called The Chicken or the Egg, not Chicken and the Egg, uh, Six Sigma and Lean. And I began, that was in 2011. And uh, recently I saw some comments about there that I did not understand what Lean was and that I was a Six Sigma person. And I found that very interesting because my path uh, did not lead me uh, in that direction, nor did I start where the person said I was. So taking this uh, chicken and egg or lean versus Six Sigma and many of the comments uh, and even one that I found online, uh, is there really a debate or not? Uh, online, I found this comment on Villanova University, a you know large, good, great university who's also doing um, Lean Six Sigma certifications over the past decade. They stated, there's an ongoing debate in the business world about whether Lean or Six Sigma is the better system to implement when it comes to streamlining business processes and eliminating waste. Both sides have proponents and detractors who can cite various situations in which one system may produce better results than the other. And it goes on to talk about the benefits of both Lean and Six Sigma, which is a good thing. But what I found interesting about this statement is what it says Lean or Six Sigma might be better at, which leads to possibly why people think you use Lean or Six Sigma. They're implying here that Lean or Six Sigma is the best at streamlining business processes and eliminating waste. And at first glance, I would say, well, lean is actually the right thing to do that. Uh, it doesn't say that lean or Six Sigma is the best system to drive uh, customer satisfaction, improve the customer experience. Uh, so it's kind of missing a point of the origination of Six Sigma was to create high quality goods and services. And lean at its outset was to be able to produce high quality goods and services much faster. Now, over time, there have been various comments uh, directed at me by leaders, uh, directed at me by hostile uh, customers or, or practitioners of other techniques. And these are some of the typical ones that I hear and maybe you hear. And, and I'd love to uh, see you place up on the screen any comment that you might have heard or would like to throw out there. Uh, lean is faster than Six Sigma. Uh, lean is great for manufacturing, but not for services. Six Sigma is too complex. Six Sigma focuses on customers. Lean is in internally focused. And although at face value, you don't want to get into an argument debating these, but the person saying it or asking it uh, is usually asking it for a real purpose in mind. One is he or she may have had a senior leader in their company say, well, I heard lean is faster, so why are we doing Six Sigma? Or uh, the person is really strong at one method and doesn't know the skills of the other, so might support one versus the other. Or they really believe that there's a difference. Regardless of what you hear, the question might be, is there a debate? Is it fiction or reality? And in fact, uh, maybe it's just people who want to be king of the hill. Um, Dr. Duran had some humor in his, uh, in his witty self. And at one time, uh, someone asked him, you know, Dr. Duran, what's the difference between 
quality improvement and process improvement or what's the difference between quality improvement and re-engineering and re-engineering and lean and lean and six sigma and there are real reasons why these techniques exist why they had one name and then another how they evolve but if someone is out there preaching six sigma is best or six sigma is more best or lean is best it may be because they want to be king of their hill and being king of the hill brings you a lot of authority so for those of you who want to be king or queen of the hill then you're going to stand by your lean or six sigma however you might be missing an opportunity that could better your organization uh, we have felt from the origination of the Duran Institute way back in oh, 1978 um, that, yes, believe it or not, uh, there was lean and there was predecessor to Six Sigma called quality improvement, that they're equal, meaning they have their purpose and their purpose is focused in areas where they want it. Now, if you don't define Lean and Six Sigma in this way, there's a pretty good chance you're going to argue that one is better or one is different than the other. So the first thing I'd like to tell everyone is whenever you're trying to end a debate, first get an operational definition of what we're referring to. For instance, if I uh, told you what I learned about Lean in the 1980s, which was referred to as just-in-time manufacturing. And I was taught by a great guy named Richard Schoenberger. Um, this was pre-lean thinking, pre-WOMAC, pre-lean enterprise. Uh, it was pretty much what I still think it is today, focused on removing waste, increasing speed, uh, removing non-value-added activity, and focusing on the customer from a perspective of value, but not necessarily focus on the customer in terms of the product capability or the uh, service capability that we are offering. Now, in that same period of time, um, Six Sigma had really come in vogue about 1986, and I got involved in this about 1983, uh, and that the real purpose was to, and it was an extension of the quality improvement movement to improve the quality of goods and services. But as it began to move into processes and business processes, it started to morph and get beyond uh, what quality of product and goods were or product of service and start to tiptoe onto what lean looked like. Uh, but instead of just focusing on the eight wastes, it focused on removing variation, identifying causes of defect, um, do some optimization of process, and it was focused on the customer. And one could say that Six Sigma makes you accurate and Lean makes you fast, but if you don't define it, you're not going to end the debate. So I'm going to use this as the jumping point uh, from whether there's a debate or not. I believe there is a debate out there. I believe it's an unnecessary debate, and it's one that wastes time. But if you're engaged in it, you probably want to resolve it. So I hope I can give you a, a few tips here today. Now, if you don't define Lean and Six Sigma um, in a way that you are truly understand it and your organization, or if you're a consultant, that your customers understand it, you're going to find various documents like this uh, out there on the web. Uh, there's nothing wrong with them. It's just that, as an example, they define things differently. Uh, they might call Six Sigma a little bit of lean, lean, lean manufacturing. Uh, they have total quality management, which might look just like quality improvement or Six Sigma. So everyone has their own definition. Uh, what I always like to do is, is remind you that where you began your career is probably what you were focused more on. So if you began your career as a real lean person, then that's probably the debate that you're going to maintain. And if you grew up as a quality improvement slash Six Sigma person, it's a pretty good chance you're going to be in that camp. But the reality is, if you really want to improve performance of a business, the business must be efficient and effective. And the best way that I help my clients is say, 
You can be efficient without having customer satisfaction, but you can never be effective without having customer satisfaction. So Lean and Six Sigma will get you efficient and effective. However, you'd better not just be efficient. You better be both. And if you think Lean drives efficiency, then you will become efficient. But if you don't add something to your toolbox in the form of product design based on customers, product development, or even removing the defects that the customer sees, you're not going to truly get to where you want to go. And unfortunately, the evolution of Six Sigma and Lean definitely went down similar but different paths. Now, I believe that uh, my own um, thinking is, is stemmed from my early training, uh, which I was uh, a participant in many uh, Deming training events, as some of you are. I also had the benefit of sitting through Dr. Duran and the Duran Institutes. I've been to the Crosby Institute. In the 80s, we were trying to learn whatever we could. I mentioned uh, Richard Schoenberger came to our organization and taught us just-in-time manufacturing. Uh, now, those things didn't happen uh, because uh, somebody invented them in the 80s. I think you have to go back and, and take a look at that chicken and egg and say, hey, you know, Japanese became really good at manufacturing automobiles better than anybody else. They were also really darn good at producing high quality products better than everyone else, but not until the 70s. Prior to the 70s, we pretty much in America didn't see much of them. So what happened? Well, according to research, and according to research not conducted by me, uh, Deming, Duran, and many others were invited to Japan uh, under the guidance of General MacArthur, who for your history buffs, uh, was the general in charge of reconstruction of Japan after an unfortunate World War II. And through the lectures of Deming and Duran, uh, it began their re-education of how to produce products to become competitive so they can regain uh, their social status in their country and survive in the world. And because they were starting anew and fresh from the battles that they had, uh, folks like Deming and Duran provided quite a bit of education and hence influence on Japan. Now, Deming and Duran were also uh, widely used everywhere else. But the, the difference was uh, Japan had a crisis and many of the Japanese executives found the benefit in what these gentlemen were teaching. Now, I can't speak for Dr. Deming. I can only speak for Dr. Duran sounding an alarm. Uh, Dr. Deming sounded different alarms at a little different time. But uh, this comment here by Karu Ishikawa, the father of the quality in Japan, uh, and probably the guru of Japanese uh, business improvement, uh, in his book, The Japanese Way, uh, What is Total Quality Control of the Japanese Way, uh, he explained about Dr. Duran's reputation and quality in 1954. And he goes on to talk about, and the Japanese called quality control uh, quality control. They called quality improvement quality control. And at that time, it really was about quality control. And that uh, one of Duran's uh, expertise or areas of expertise was to get business executives to think about quality of control beyond the production floor. And it's a concern of the entire management. And with that, uh, Duran visited. Uh, Japanese businesses and Japanese leaders a number of times. And in his own words, when he went to teach in Japan, the same subject he was teaching everywhere else in the world, the students in the class were leaders of Japanese companies. When he taught around the world, the students in the class were quality engineers and quality assurance managers. And he found that fascinating that with the same information taught to different levels became different results. The end result was that Japanese, with the help of Deming, Duran, and others, started to change the way they produce and create products 
and started eliminating the defects and the failures, which gave them a lot of time to then develop and create high quality goods and services as to which we know today. Now, that doesn't mean that the United States or Europe uh, was far behind, but they were clearly behind because I know I was in an organization that uh, was pretty much decimated by Japanese competition in semiconductor equipment field. And um, we all know about uh, the 1980s with Six Sigma being strong, which was created uh, at Motorola. But it's really interesting what happened between the late 60s where Japan and Dr. Duran warned American businesses, if the West does not improve its rate of improvement, Japanese will overtake them in the next decade. And surely by the 19, late 1970s, we were starting to really see that competition. Particularly Motorola, which was a really large company at the time, and of course there were no cell phones at that time that I know of. Uh, Motorola's leadership, uh, particularly a gentleman named Art Sundry, stood up and said, our quality stinks and we cannot compete with the Japanese Nippon Electric Corporation, NEC, without major changes. So they, in 1980, created a strategy uh, that was going to focus on uh, significant improvements in quality, participative management, focusing on global competitiveness, and creating an incredible training and education institute known as the Motorola Training Institute. By the 1986, Six Sigma was born. And Six Sigma was born in Motorola for a simple reason. Uh, and that reason, I asked the then founder, founder uh, of Motorola on a plane that I was on with Dr. Duran because I wanted to hear firsthand how did he come about with Six Sigma? How did they create Six Sigma? And this is what he said. He said, quality had so many definitions that every time I talked about quality, my organization would respond in ways that I really didn't understand. So we realized that the word quality in itself had so many different variations. I assigned a team led by Bill Smith to come up with a better way to communicate the importance of quality and quality improvement. And that team came back with the term Six Sigma. And the Six Sigma term was a metric that could be easily calculated for any process anywhere to determine uh, how that process was performing. Additionally, the Motorola Training Institute created a curriculum that was going to teach how to achieve Six Sigma, and eventually that led to the acronym of DMAIC, Define, Measure, Analyze, Improve, and Control. And like some of the organizations you may have been part of, be part of, or read about, uh, Motorola was kind enough to share all that Six Sigma knowledge with their customers and suppliers, which is how I benefited from it. And um, over the next 20 years, Six Sigma was introduced into our organizations. Now, I highlight what took place before 1979 because uh, I found this fascinating. Motorola didn't invent quality improvement. Motorola just tried to come up with a better way to communicate it. And I know for a fact uh, what they were doing and how they were doing it. Uh, and I found it very interesting that uh, Motorola was one of the first clients of, of Dr. Duran and the Duran Institute. And they had purchased a videotape series called Duran on Quality Improvement. It was 15 videotapes that walked through um, basically how to do quality improvement. And in there, Dr. Duran, I talked about the cost of poor quality, the Duran Pareto Principle, the Diagnostic Journey, the Remedial Journey, and really the predecessor to DMAIC was the breakthrough sequence of quality improvement, which Dr. Duran wrote about in the 50s and the 60s. And, and with that um, videotape series, Motorola took it, modified it, improved it, 
and created Six Sigma. Now, I'm not trying to explain to you that what Duran did. I'm trying to explain to you that an evolution takes place when the real practitioners, the organizations that have to apply methods that have worked in one company transferred to another, they morph. And so we have quality improvement morphing into Six Sigma and along the way capturing the wallets and hearts of many of our organizations. Now, by the 1980s, it was clear that quality Quality was king. Uh, Duran on quality leadership, Deming's Out of Crisis. Um, these were big popular books and big events, and I'm not trying to shy away from others that were there. But if you're a practitioner today and you lived through those 80s like I did, uh, quality and Six Sigma were king because they were. We had a quality crisis. Now, by the 1990s, uh, quality as it's perceived by the customer, was clearly improving. Uh, but now we had a new focus, and that focus wasn't created just because the Japanese uh, were that much better. The Japanese were really now gaining in, in profitability and high quality over a sustained period. Uh, and uh, at that time, particularly around 1990, uh, John Womack uh, was part of a $5 million study looking into the quality and the automobile manufacturing and production in Japan versus the U.S. Uh, and the reason why it was, if you look at this graph, that the U.S. production of cars significantly dropped uh, in the mid to late 70s uh, and didn't regain itself for almost a decade later what was happening and at the same time the japanese production was continuing to go up now we know that production means people were buying your products and lack of production means they're not and uh, womack and his team created a book called the machine that changed the world and it really did change the way we thought about uh, operating our businesses uh, later that was uh, succeeded uh, by uh, lean thinking, as well as uh, the Toyota way. These books talked about how the Japanese businesses focused their improvement on speed, efficiency, and th throughput, combined with the quality they learned in the decade before, created this enormous uh, wealth of knowledge in Japan that then started to become transferred over here. The interesting thing about this chart is Dr. Duran uses a chart, or used a chart when he was alive, that showed the East versus the West in terms of quality. And it's startling how in 1969, where Dr. Duran made the statement publicly that if America doesn't do something fast, they're going to be overtaken by the Japanese in a decade. It's almost exactly 1979 where that overtaking in production happened in automobiles. Now, by 2000, um, the debate starts to happen. Like, you know, we got quality in the 80s and 90s, and we got lean uh, in the mid-90s to late 90s. So what's next? Well, what next is really driven by the need of businesses. And there were many laggards who needed to be more efficient, and they need lean, and there were many laggards in quality and they needed Six Sigma because that was what it was. Um, and then there are those companies that realize that an organization consists of efficiency and effective processes or inefficient and ineffective processes. It consists of good products and poor products. It consists of great services and lackluster services. And in order to meet the expectation, uh, you really do need to have complementary improvement programs. Um, it's unfortunate that lean grew up uh, in manufacturing because it's referred to as the Toyota production system, but it doesn't mean it's only for manufacturing. We've also heard Six Sigma was a manufacturing thing, but we know that it's not just manufacturing. And yes, they both came out of manufacturing and they are both being implemented quite successfully outside of manufacturing, but they morph as well when they go into um, these other industries, particularly today, healthcare in the United States, hospitals. Uh, hospitals have a measure of performance that if, 
if they don't achieve high quality patient outcomes, they get reimbursed less and penalized. Consequently, if they don't focus on efficiency, they don't make any money because they're getting reimbursed less. So they have to be much leaner, much faster. And by the way, when you're in a hospital, if you could do things faster and safer, you're gonna get better patient outcomes. Uh, and if you do things faster and safer, there's a pretty good chance that the reasons why you were slow uh, were wasteful and you got rid of them. So the application of Lean and Six Sigma uh, are a powerful pair. Now, some of you might be saying, wow, it's 2017, and um, you know where do we stand today? Well, it's all about where your business stands, not whether one's more popular than the other. Uh, for instance, uh, if you were a strong, if you were in General Electric uh, in the 1990s and 2000, you were talking, living, breathing Six Sigma, and then Six Sigma evolved into um, at the customer for the customer, a highly customer experience focused utilizing methods of Six Sigma. My guess, if if you were there long enough, you would have seen the Lean application. Today, you'd probably see both and probably thinking about how to extend it further. Organizations mature and move to new levels of performance, which require different methods at different times. And so what you really should be thinking about is, what is right for my business? Where is my business going? Uh, and before I continue, I'd like to uh, share any comments or questions that you might have. Uh, Dr. Ferron, would, would you like to chime in here? Uh, yeah, I'm I'm uh, I'm learning. <laughs> uh, I, I really appreciate how you've gone back, Joe, and brought us forward uh, because I think it it puts us right on the point of your uh, stopping here, which is uh, well, then if there's going to be integration between the two, uh, how then do we go about doing that? Uh, I'm looking also to see if anyone has posed questions. You haven't yet, uh, but please feel free to do so. And also there's a chat tool that I failed to mention, uh, and you can always make your comments there in any form you wish. Uh, but uh, Joe, let's just keep going because you, you got me on the edge of my seat. Well, I'm not sure there's much more seat or edge of seat left here. Uh, but you know, here we are in here we are in 2017. Uh, and um, we have newcomers that are just learning and just beginning Lean and Six Sigma. And uh, because we're in such a highly focused cost reduction, low price uh, environment, let's face it, everything is getting cheaper for a reason. It's either because we're cheapening it or we're making them much more efficiently. Uh, and at the same time, the quality of goods and services is, is fairly good. Uh, we have good alternatives. Um, but if you're just a new practitioner, um, I can't tell you to go back and read all the history because clearly it may not be important anymore. Just don't assume that your starting point is the only time anyone started from that point. Uh, I debate with my 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 children, my family, my clients all the time, but debating the past is not going to necessarily uh, make the future any better. But we do have a saying at Duran based on George Santiana, those who fail to look at the past are condemned to repeat it. Uh, and so if you don't look at the past, then you might be walking uh, through various steps along the way that may not be so great for you. Uh, and, and if you want to know more about Lean and Six Sigma, and so that you could have more credibility, uh, define it clearly for your organization. If you like the slide here that Lean is about uh, waste and um, less waste, and if Six Sigma is about more accuracy, great. Uh, because something might come along and, and change it. Now today, we combine these tools of Lean Six Sigma. And uh, I will just say in my own experience, um, when you take two methodologies and cram them together and you call it Lean Six Sigma, uh, it makes for a very difficult way to teach people. So I, I think, uh, and, and our belief is that um, define, measure, analyze, improve, and control are a great way to carry out Lean and Six Sigma, uh, but the tools you use along the way, the 6S from Lean, the SMED, uh, pull versus push, Kanban, uh, are great tools to be leaner, 
uh, and exposed quality defects in Six Sigma, problem solving, diagnostic analysis oriented, designed for culture. Uh, they both go hand in hand. So please, you know, uh, do your homework, do your research. Just don't threat, fret, or worry about the past uh, because in a blink of an eye, uh, something may come along that makes this evolve. Now, uh, I mentioned uh, King of the Hill, Queen of the Hill, uh, and um, and the chicken and the egg. I think what's important is that if your organization is looking to reduce cost, and by reducing cost, you're focusing on reducing waste, there's no question that the whole term lean management means we're going to be leaner. But unless your lean management uh, is defined in a way that doesn't help you lean the right stuff, you may be more efficient but not effective. And consequently, if your business is struggling to satisfy customer requirements and your Six Sigma program focuses only on reducing defects, then you may not get economical performance. And think about this. The outcome of a process is efficient and effective to meet the need of the customer because the price is driven by efficiency as well as profitability of the company. Now, the company could improve its profitability and not reduce the price, making them more profitable, or the, the company could reduce the cost, pass that off to the customer. Depending on your competitiveness and your need to be more competitive, you can adjust the price based on what you need. But you can't be efficient without being effective for very long. And you can't be effective without being efficient for very long. So either use the right method at the right time or keep in mind there are both methods of importance. Uh, and if you don't like what I'm saying, you can choose to go out and create your own hill uh, and then you could be queen or king of that hill. And what we mean by that is if you don't like a method and you don't like the way it's being used or, or you don't like the way uh, it's being applied, then you're probably going to get frustrated and you're going to start adopting or adapting or evolving or morphing your method to something that you think is better. And maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But at least in my own mind, we can create our own hills and we could be king and queen for a day. And let me tell you, sometimes uh, being the king of the mountain is great and other times it's not. So please uh, think about the debate. If there is one, put it aside uh, and use the right method at the right time. Uh, and I will hopefully be more articulate next time that I write an article, which implies lean is not customer focused. Uh, I just would like to say this last thing, that uh, it is what you want it to be. And the experience I have seen is that many executives want to be lean, but may not be using the lean tools. Many executives want to be free of failure, but they not, may not be using the Six Sigma tools. These tools and methods are out there for a reason. They've worked somewhere else, and they could work in your organization if you give us a chance and give them a chance. So uh, I'd like to thank you. Uh, this is a shorter one because I can't debate with you. I can't really have a dialogue with you. But I have put my email address here, and I'd love to hear from you. Uh, and as these things get posted and other people listen to them, I always get more feedback. Uh, but we'd love to hear from you. And um, and Dave, I'd like to flip it back to you because by yeah. now sure you have a question. Yeah, I do, um, Joe. Uh, we have a, a, a system of training, the belt system, yellow belt, and so forth. Uh, could you help us put into perspective the direction training needs to go to support Lean and Six Sigma, and how that belt uh, concept, which Duran uh, has evolved over the years, uh, can still serve people. Yeah, actually interesting. Um, you know, I, I try to go out there and read current uh, articles and current ways people are talking uh, prior to each of these webinars because I don't want to get stuck in my own thinking. Uh, and I actually came across, um, this is how debates start, that 
the belt concept, which we all give credit to the karate industry, was actually created for the judo methodology. So uh, I'll apologize on behalf of all the people who have called it a karate. Um, but what happened was um, there are big problems and there's little problems. Uh, we need experts and we need specialists and we need generalists. And Motorola recognized early on that, uh, and, and also my own learning, you know, you, you can't teach everybody every tool and every method. And clearly you can't teach people statistical methods when they're not really loving it. Uh, and I'll just leave it at that. So Motorola realized that there are different roles people play in an organization and uh, some want to be leaders, some want to be followers, some want to be uh, experts, some want to be specialists, and some want to be generalists. And also, more importantly, problems come in different sizes. So if you have a large business problem and you're trying to create breakthrough and you have an unknown cause, then you need some skill level that allows you to do that. But if you're just participating on a team with that expert, I don't need to know everything she or he knows. I just need to know enough. And if I'm occasionally going to be involved or work on smaller projects, I need to know even less. So instead of coming up with, you know, a journey person, an expert, um, Motorola decided, you know, it's a pretty good way to say, why don't we adopt the martial arts color of belts, which imply different levels of skill. And so, hence, the green and black belt came about. Later on, people added yellow, people added white, uh, and master black belt. And the, uh, the um, kind of commendation of the color of the belt says you are superior in your skill set that you have learned. And that skill set has become a way to provide training, certification, and skill development. And so, yes, I think it's a, it's a great way to distinguish the differences between skill sets. I think it's a great way to uh, recognize people for their individual performance. Matter of fact, Dr. Duran felt that it was probably the best recognition given to people learning the quality improvement methodologies that he had seen in his lifetime. Uh, whether that sticks for the future, I think what happens is as we go forward and create white, yellow, green, and black, and master black, the question is, how many of each do you really need in the organization, and what skill set do you need? And where, you know, 15 years ago, we were training thousands of black belts, today we're training tens of thousands of yellow belts, not so many black belts. And why? Well, I think the way work is being, uh, the tasks are being done, and the, uh, the big data and technology we have, a lot of the hard analysis tools are made available in a much easier way. So instead of spending 16 days in a classroom, you know, people can spend two days or two hours and get the information. So they're learning it faster. They don't have to rely so much on the hard stuff. So we need less black belts, uh, more yellow belts. And so I think a uh, long answer to a good question um, and I think it's around for now, but some people do get crazy about it and add blue belts and purple belts and, and all that stuff. But keep in mind, there are many degrees of belts in the martial arts, too, so you can go crazy with it. I don't think there's <laughs> enough curriculum uh, in the body of knowledge to do that in this industry. But I do recognize that uh, companies that have achieved both efficiency and a high effectiveness uh, and many times attributed to the leadership of their black belts who take on the major problems uh, that uh, need to be solved uh, systematically with teams. Uh, so that level of leadership uh, seems to be pretty instrumental in how a company can pull together both lean and six. Yeah, you know, Dave, another point here. In martial arts, if you wear a black belt and you get into a one-on-one -on -one match with another black belt. If you don't have the skills, you're going to be a hurting buckaroo pretty quick. So I would like to say that the, the downside of belts is that people want the belt and may not want to do the work. And, and so you go get a green belt, but you never really worked on a project or you worked on one and you didn't do any more. 
Um, the reason why there are different levels of belts is to continuously improve your skills. And so if you only get trained as yellow or only get trained as green uh, and you don't do enough practice, just having the belt is recognition, but it doesn't mean you have a skill set. So be very cautious of, of poor, poor education programs that give you belts but don't give you skills. Well, Joe, do you have anything else to add? Because I want to give a little bit of a point to next our next webinar in October. No, I'm grateful, and I'd love to hear from people. You can get me directly. I don't screen uh, those emails. Just be kind. Take care. See the you last next Wednesday. The last Wednesday in October, the 25th, uh, Joe will be back uh, with uh, his seminar on quality winning business. Key winning business. I can imagine anyone out there who wouldn't be interested in the connection between quality and that achievement of continuously growing business. So once again, we thank you for your uh, participation today and look forward to be back with you on October 25th.